Thank you so much, Scott, for inviting me. I'm sorry we couldn't travel to uh, Fort Worth to be with you and to see lots of you in person and to uh, have personal conversations with participants. Uh, I want to say before I start that uh, I've been involved in uh, speaking about music and writing about music for some time, although my uh, day job involves a, a broader scope of cultural concerns. Uh, but for those of you who might be interested in other things I've done about music specifically, uh, I've been writing a column for Touchstone magazine for a number of years, and those are available. Uh, some of them are, are available online. I also do a lot with Mars Hill Audio about music. I've done a lot of interviews with music historians and philosophers and theologians about music. And uh, I'm music director at my church. Music director means I, I, I organize uh, the music for the worship services, I direct the choir, and I also do a lot of music education in our church, which uh, is, I think, a very important part of, of music ministry. I, could, I might address that a little bit later. For the last 35 years or so, I've been involved in, and committed most of my time to exploring the dynamics of contemporary cultural life, interested in two big questions. Uh, the first is what might our cultural lives look like if we live them in ways that were consistent with the biblical account of human nature and human flourishing, if we were really uh, sailing with all of our sails unfurled and li living f in a fully uh, faithful way. And then secondly, how and why has Western culture taken the shape that it has? How did we get to the point where uh, we see the kinds of trends and particularly the challenges uh, presented to Christians to be faithful. Um, I developed my interest in these questions uh, very early on. I was in college, I uh, majored in film studies. Uh, there weren't a lot of Christians in the 1970s majoring in film studies. I was also involved in music. And then later, I worked at National Public Radio in the arts department. Um, in the 70s and early 80s, I was arts editor for Morning Edition. Uh, I was the only Christian that I knew of at, at NPR at the time. Uh, I sometimes joke I was the token fascist, but uh, actually I was treated better than that. Um, but I was really interested in trying to understand what was it about modern culture that um, made the gospel seem so implausible to, to our contemporaries. And I think that that uh, condition has actually uh, worsened in, in the last uh, 40 years or so. Um, what are the assumptions about God or the transcendent? What are the assumptions about human nature, about the significance of the material world, about the nature of history, about truth, about authority, about good and evil, about reason and freedom? What are the deeply held intuitions encouraged by our cultural institutions and by the patterns of everyday life about these things that stand in the way of, of Christian profession? And, uh, of course, we need to recognize that the same cultural forces which make uh, the gospel seem implausible also uh, constrict the exercise of our faithfulness uh, or of the consequences of our faith. That make it, uh, those same cultural forces make it difficult for Christians to imagine what a fully operational obedience might look like. So even many deeply pious Christians are what sociologist Craig Gay has called practical atheists. Um, Monday through Saturday, uh, we often live as if God doesn't exist, and that, in fact, that's the subtitle of uh, Craig Gay's book called The Way of the Modern World, Why It's Tempting to Live as If God Doesn't Exist. Many modern Christians have accepted a form of faith that has it ro has roots in the Enlightenment, by which Christianity is assumed to be a private matter, and so both, ironically, modern believers and unbelievers are, are uh, likely to assume that the gospel addresses concerns that are purely inward and personal um, and not public and cultural. And on this model, clergy tend to be treated, if you'll pardon this metaphor, more like cruise directors than shepherds. They're people with clipboards and uplifting insights, not shepherds, crooks and uh, exhortations and discipline. Uh, clergy are, are handily available to make the lives of their clients more pleasant, but not intrusively to exercise directive nurture and discipline. That 
situation, which many clergy might find uh, actually an accurate description of how they feel they're treated. I talked to one pastor who said he was treated more like the pool boy uh, th than a leader in his church. Um, it's not surprising that the faith of many folks who are regular churchgoers is a form of what sociologist Christian Smith calls moralistic therapeutic deism and not orthodox Christianity. Uh, if you don't know that phrase, it comes from his 2005 book, Soul Searching, The Religious and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers. And uh, at that time, uh, at the time the book came out, it was the most extensive study ever done of what teenagers believed about God and faith and what their religious practices were. Christian Smith, uh, someone I had the pleasure of interviewing when the book came out, and he told me that he was shocked in many cases at how little teenagers understood the content of their own religious traditions. He did dozens of interviews and eventually realized that there was a fairly co coherent religious belief system. And, and this is actually a quote from my interview with him. Across religious traditions, the teens seem to be saying very similar things that I eventually labeled moralistic therapeutic deism. And that can be summarized as God exists, God created the world, God orders the world. That's how we understand why things are the way they are. So it's deistic. There is a God out there. Uh, and the purpose of life is to be a nice person. It's to be good, pleasant, kind. Uh, it's morally oriented. It's fairly pro-social. But God doesn't have to be particularly involved in one's life unless you get into trouble or need help. And then you call on God. And I say, and again, these are Smith's words, I say that God in this system is something like a cosmic therapist or a divine butler, uh, sort of doesn't need to get in the way, professionally takes care of your problems, doesn't hang around the rest of your life. The purpose of life is to be happy. Uh, that's what we're here for, individual happiness. And there is a heaven and good people go to heaven and most everybody's good. That's, uh, that's his, that was his, uh, his summary. Uh, one of Smith's colleagues on this research project was Kenda Creasy Dean. She wrote her own book that examined the consequences of the study for the church, a book called Almost Christian, What the Faith of Our Teenagers is Telling the American Church. And I also interviewed her. And during the interview with her, she said something that's haunted me ever since. One of the things that's really tricky to convey to parents is that if you're trying to form your kids to be Christians, it's not going to fit for them very well for American culture. Uh, it's a lot easier, she said, to raise kids who are what she calls Christian-ish, uh, who are capable of affirming a few central beliefs but have very little consequences in their lives shaped uh, decisively by those beliefs. And she quoted philosopher James K.A. Smith, who observes, quote, could it be the case that learning a Christian perspective doesn't actually touch my desire, and that while I might be able to think about the world from a Christian perspective, at the end of the day, I love not the kingdom of God, but rather the kingdom of the market. Now, both Smith and Dean and his colleagues argued that uh, young people are moralistic, therapeutic deists, or Christian-ish, because their parents and their churches haven't done an adequate job discipling them. Discipling them. And my own view is that American churches have typically not done a thorough enough job in converting people away from the assumptions about reality that are embedded in modern culture. And uh, I say that based on the conclusions of, of a lot of people smarter than I am and, 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 and better connected to the life of the church than I am, people who I've had a chance to, uh, to, to interview for Marcel Audio. And I think that one reason for that pattern of failure in discipleship is that the comprehensiveness of Christ's lordship hasn't been affirmed robustly enough. Um, when the gospel is first announced, it's depicted as the arrival of the comprehensive rule of Christ the King. The kingdom of God is at hand. And when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, he instructs them to plead with the Father that his divine rule be made as evident on earth as it is in heaven. And then when Christ commissions the church just before he ascends to be seated on a heavenly throne to rule all things, I like to point out he's seated at the right hand of the Father to rule, not to relax. This is not some celestial barca lounger that our Lord uh, uh, resides on. 
when he commissions the church just before the ascension, he declares his authority over all things in heaven and on earth. And the task that he gives his disciples is to make more disciples, not just converts, teaching them to observe everything that he's commanded. And he's the ruler of all. So the Great Commission is actually a comprehensive commission. It's not just get people saved, get them to heaven. Uh, um, it's, and I think that's the beginning for how, uh, of how the church should think about uh, our cultural lives. Um, our engagement with cultural matters should not be pursued just for the sake of designing tactics uh, to communicate a narrow message that encourages belief in just a few claims about sin and grace. Uh, if that's the case, um, then we're ignoring the, the thrust of the Great Commission. The church has the mission of enculturating its members into a way of life that is the way of the kingdom of God. Um, in Paul's letter to Titus, uh, Paul says that we should not just teach doctrine, but teach those things which are in accord with sound doctrine, uh, that the lives of, every, uh, of believers in everything uh, they do may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So it's not just a matter of teaching good doctrine, but it's a matter of, of uh, enculturating people into a way of life. Now, the way of life that most Christians, I think, uh, embrace is a way of life that's been shaped by, uh, by American culture. Um, and uh, th that is increasingly problematic. Uh, uh, again, one reason I think that we have a hard time in what I think of as whole earth discipleship is that we tend to uh, neglect the continuity between God's creation and the work of redemption. Uh, last Sunday, Western Christians celebrated the resurrection. Uh, and... Um, I, I think that when, when we remember the fact of the resurrection, one of the things that we should learn from the fact of the resurrection is uh, that um, our redemption does not involve the redemption from creation, but the redemption of creation. It's in a human body uh, that Christ is redeemed. Oliver O'Donovan, a theologian who's influenced me a lot in this book called Resurrection and Moral Order, writes that human sinfulness has not been allowed to uncreate what God created. Man's life is on earth is important to God. He's given it its order. It matters that it should conform to the order that he's given it. Uh, there's an order in creation that should inform every aspect of our lives. So striving to be faithful Im implies, striving to be faithful to Christ implies being faithful to the order of reality that's held together by Christ. And there I'm using a phrase from Colossians chapter 1. The means whereby we glorify God and enjoy him forever is through engagement as embodied souls with the material world in all of its diversity and specificity. We're not created to glorify God and enjoy him forever in a purely mental trance-like state, but as we care for the world that he's made and a world in which he delights. Now, uh, so the church really needs to, in its discipling vocation, uh, needs to discern between cultural forms that do justice to the order of creation and those that don't. It must encourage its members to go beyond belief in key doctrines and be beyond just mere morality um, and to uh, order their lives, their ordering of time, their habits uh, in embodied activity, uh, in how they uh, use language, uh, in economic matters, in politics, all of those ways uh, fittingly honor not just the law of God, uh, not just what has been revealed uh, in Scripture, but also the order that's present in God's creation. Now, let me say a few things about music ministry in light of uh, this whirlwind introduction to the notion of discipleship. Um, a number of years ago, I was speaking in a church uh, and uh, I was teaching a Sunday school class, actually. I stayed for the worship service. The pastor took me and a few of the elders out to dinner or to lunch after, after the service. And in the car on the way to the restaurant, the pastor asked me what I thought of the worship service. And I had been intending on not making any comments uh, about the service, mainly because the music had seemed, uh, well, uh, infantile. I'm afraid to say. Uh, 
And I paused to collect my thoughts. And then I offered what I thought was a charitable and generous appraisal. I said, it's sad that the level of musical knowledge in our culture right now is so low that churches have had to dumb down their music. Now this, uh, maybe dumb was not the best verb to use in that setting, but I was really surprised at the vehemence of his response. Uh, it was clear that he thought that music wasn't the kind of experience that lent itself to the category of intelligence one way or another. Music was irrational in this pastor's view. It was something that was incapable of objective assessment. Um, and we spent about an hour batting this question around in a relatively friendly Christianish sort of way. And the thing that impressed me most uh, about the conversation was that this pastor really knew next to nothing about music. He confessed to that fact. But he believed that he was qualified to make bold statements about the nature of music, as qualified as if he was at Yo-Yo Ma or someone. Now, I think it's fair to say that his assumptions were more in keeping with the spirit of the age than with historic Christian thinking about the nature of music. Uh, the nature and the consumption of music today is generally assumed to be an expression of something that's deeply personal, instinctive, and beyond thoughtful discipline. And Christians typically believe about music the same sorts of things that their neighbors believe. Um, if we look at the history of the church's thinking about music, we see very different sets of assumptions. Um, and uh, uh, Isidore of Seville, a, a, a sixth century, early seventh century uh, theologian, uh, said in without music there can be no perfect knowledge for there is nothing without it even the universe itself is said to have been put together with a certain harmony of sounds and the very heavens revolve under the guidance of harmony that's an expression of an intuition about music that theologians have had uh, since the earliest days of christian theology um, uh, today music tends to be treated or regarded again more as a personal thing and within churches it's often treated as a marketing tool uh, not a reflection of, of, of cosmic order. Clement of Alexandria in the early third century expressed a view that was typical of patristic writers in urging believers to seek out musical experiences that echoed the melodious order and harmonious arrangement of the universe. Like other theologians of the early church, Clement believed in a fundamental relationship between the oral harmony of music and the harmonious arrangement of all of creation as ordered by the Logos, by the Word of God. Good music wasn't just pleasant sound, it was a window into transcendent reality. And as Clement put it, Christ, quote, composed the universe into melodious order and tuned the discord of the elements to harmonious arrangement so that the whole world uh, might become harmony. Uh, I would uh, encourage you all to, if you're not familiar with how the church has understood music historically, many of you probably have read in those early sources. Um, uh, Calvin Stapert, uh, who, who taught for many years at, at Calvin College, uh, taught music there, has, has compiled a number of their ideas and called A New Song for an Old World, Musical Thought in the Early Church. Now, the view that I've outlined or suggested uh, very cursorily uh, is a very extremely uh, unpopular view today, I realize. I take comfort in Flannery O'Connor's statement, uh, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you odd. But let me conclude with six propositions about music that I think could serve as reference points in thinking about what, uh, how the church's discipleship can repudiate uh, moralistic therapeutic deism. Uh, first, to recognize that music is a unique gift of God. It has the capacity to represent and in some way enable us to participate in the order of God's creation. It's not just a mode of personal expression. It's a way of knowing something about objective reality. Uh, uh, and uh, it addresses the body, the intellect, the imagination, and the emotions in a uniquely powerful way. Uh, it's a great and powerful mystery, something I would argue that unites uh, heaven and earth. And every Sunday in my church, uh, we say before we sing uh, the uh, song from Isaiah, holy, 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 we affirm that we sing praise in union with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. Uh, second, like all of God's good gifts, music can be corrupted and abused. Musical forms and musical practices aren't neutral. Uh, they are made uh, 
they are not made worthy or unworthy simply by our intentions or by the words that we attach to music. A third, modern culture has significantly disordered our musical practices, uh, not as a result of some vicious conspiracy, but as a consequence of a host of other cultural developments that have uh, that, that, that are tied really to philosophical and theological assumptions in our culture, and that that disordering prevents us from perceiving the fullest capacities of music. Uh, fourth, and this is related to the third point, the disordering of our musical practices has an interesting resonance or analogy with other disorders, notably uh, the three that I like to identify are how we treat language, how we treat food, and how we treat sexuality. Now, it's obvious that Americans are confused about the meaning of sex, and I claim that they're just as confused about the meaning of music and for a similar set of reasons. Uh, the cultural forces that have misguided our engagement with the gifts of food and language have similar effects uh, on our engagement with music. All four of those things, language, food, sex, and music, are gifts of God that orient us bodily toward God himself, toward creation, toward our communities, and toward our own created our identity. Just as jargon and propaganda corrupt our experience of language, just as convenience and commodification spoil our perception of the meaning of food, uh, just as pornography, hooking up, and the exaltation of preference pervert our understanding of sexuality, so I would argue a similar set of cultural forces has cut us off from the power and the nourishment and the beauty that's available uh, in music. There are likenesses among those sets of disordered practices. Christians worry a lot about disordered sex, uh, but they don't tend to focus as much on the other three. Uh, they might focus on food or language, but again, music tends to be something that gets a kind of free ride uh, in our culture. Fifth, because music has such a powerful capacity to engage the whole person, uh, its disordering, I think, is, tends to be accompanied by a defense mechanism that resists reform. Uh, if you challenge someone's habits with regard to food, for instance, or um, how they treat language, they might accept an exhortation. But it's, easy, it's so easy for us to become so thoroughly identified with our musical preferences that, um, that any effort to improve taste is regarded uh, as, uh, as that pastor indicated to me, uh, either as nonsense or as a kind of expression of a, of a, uh, a terrible elitism. Uh, and then last, um, if we recognize that discipleship is a process of formation of the whole person, then we can't avoid addressing the ways in which the practices of music form our hearts, form our affections. Disordered musical practices make us love things that we shouldn't while depriving us of opportunities for delight in the best that music can be. Uh, the unique nature of music enables it to shape our affections and dispositions with an unparalleled power. And as a result of that, philosophers and theologians and teachers long believed that the shaping of musical taste was a significant part, in fact, a foundational part of, of moral formation. But for a host of reasons, the mid 20th century witnessed a remarkable abandonment of that concern. Uh, so music is typically, and musical affections, musical preferences uh, are now typically regarded to be uh, self, uh, self uh, authenticating. Uh, and any effort to shape taste is regarded as, uh, again, a, a woefully uh, uh, elitist. Uh, in conclusion, I just want to summarize the experience of music, and I'm sorry to whirlwind, I'm sorry about the technical problem earlier, I hope it doesn't happen again. The experience of music for most Americans has, for the past 50 years, been shaped decisively by a set of cultural ideals which uh, which bring together many of the troubling aspects of modernity more generally. Uh, music and the practice of modernity has suffered and been deprived of its highest possibilities. But the church's work of discipleship has, from the beginning, faced challenges from the surrounding culture. Many of the epistles of the New Testament testify to the fact that, that the church has always been uh, countercultural in its ministry. 
Eugene Peterson, Presby uh, former Presbyterian pastor, observed once that, quote, it is the task of the Christian community to give witness and guidance in the living of life in a culture that is relentless in reducing, constricting, and enervating life. And enervating, if that's a verb you're not familiar with, it means uh, incapacitating or weakening or fatiguing. Uh, Peterson believed that discipleship wasn't just about making your prayer life and Bible study and witnessing better organized, but that discipleship was about all of life. The church's work of discipleship should challenge all of the ways in which the surrounding culture deters us from living a full and rich and loving and fulfilling life that we're created to live. And I believe that's a recognition of, of Christ's, uh, that's what a recognition of Christ's lordship implies. Uh, avoiding conformity to the world doesn't mean that our lives are less human or less culturally rich. On the contrary, the transformation of our understanding of God and of his creation enables us to live much more fully human lives, lives that are in tune with the harmony of God's good creation. Thanks very much. Uh, I uh, will talk in the second talk about particularly about the nature of beauty and why that's a significant uh, aspect of musical experience. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much, uh, Ken, for that. Very, very enlightening and, uh, and helpful. Uh, we have some questions already coming in. Uh, if, uh, if, if you have a question this morning uh, based on uh, the, the first presentation here, uh, feel free to uh, submit those using the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. And I'll kind of collect those together and, uh, and address them to, uh, to Ken at this time. So a number of good questions here. Um, one is you mentioned uh, early in your talk uh, that the Enlightenment has sort of Im impacted us with the privatization of Christianity. Uh, and and the, the, the questioner asked, what are, what are some other uh, parallels between Enlightenment thinking and modern Christianity in America? Are, are there other aspects of, of the nature of our Christianity that have been impacted by uh, Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's a, a big question. Absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, I would say that... Uh, our understanding of the relationship between faith and reason is uh, is often influenced by Enlightenment ideas. Um, uh, our uh, understanding of uh, the significance of embodiment, uh, there's a strong Gnostic aspect to uh, the Enlightenment, uh, particularly in Descartes, uh, uh, which separates uh, knowledge separates reason from embodied experience and that's one of the reasons why i think music is assumed it it, it, it mu why music is assumed to be ah rational because uh the enlightenment uh, the enlightenment tended to uh separate severely uh, se the sensory experience from uh uh, f from knowledge. Uh, I'm thinking of a book uh, by Colin Gunton. I think it's called Enlightenment and Alienation, where he deals with that uh, in particular. Um, so th th and this, is one, this has been one of the things that's been, in a sense, a, a lifelong project of my own, because I, as a young Christian, uh, I wasn't aware of the extent to which uh, I had received a, a, uh, an Enlightenment-inflected uh, set of assumptions, uh, 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 and I was interpreting the scripture more in, in light of the Enlightenment. Someone else that I would recommend, Leslie Newbigin, who was for many years a missionary to India, whose work, uh, uh, he, he was really interested in helping converts from Hinduism uh, un, uh, unravel the assumptions that they brought to their faith uh, from their, their previous Hindu experience, uh, and they, in turn, helped him understand uh, the extent to which his faith had been shaped by, by the Enlightenment. So I, I think that that's a, that's a huge, huge issue. But those are just a few, a few examples. Right, yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you for some resources to help think through these. Those are helpful. Uh, Quentin Faulkner's book, Wiser Than Despair, uh, I yeah. think is very enlightening on this point, uh, particularly with, with, with the, the influence of Enlightenment thought on understanding music. Uh, well, the book, the book that I mentioned, New Song for an Old World, uh, Calvin Stapert, who's writing about, prin principally about patristics, he speaks uh, 
very explicitly in the introduction about how our understanding of music has been shaped by, by enlightenment assumptions. Yeah. And even people who are really interested in music um, tend to be interested in music uh, from the 18th century and later. So most people studying music professionally, uh, uh, cl classical and romantic, the 18th and 19th century, uh, they're not as familiar with 15th century music or 16th century music, pre, pre what I think of as pre-enlightenment music. Right, good. Yeah, okay, so that's, that's sort of helping us to understand the impact on our thinking. Uh, once, we, once we recognize that there's been an adjustment in thinking, we've got a couple questions here asking, okay, what are the next steps that we can take to inform ourselves about what music is doing broadly speaking, and then how music can have a discipling influence. Yeah. It. Well, I mean, I think that th there are, uh, there are more resources now uh, from theologians. Uh, Jeremy Begbie comes to mind as one that I think is important, and Calvin Stapert's work. Um, I, I think that the biggest challenge is, uh, is, is music education. I, I've written about this uh, in secular settings also. I, I was fortunate to go to public schools in the 50s and 60s when music education was still an important part of the curriculum and was uh, in, in high school at a time when uh, popular culture still didn't dominate uh, musical experience entirely. Uh, and um, and the, the public schools, by and large, gave up on music education as a, uh, in an authoritative way uh, and in an, and in a formative way. Uh, and the church basically hasn't picked up the slack. Uh, I, often, I often suggest that if, if schools stopped teaching reading, um, churches would start teaching reading <laughs> uh, because they, they would realize that um, if people are going to be good disciples, they need to be able to read the Bible. This is why Wycliffe Bible translators exist. Uh, and so, um, so I think that, uh, that at, at the local congregational level to, to begin um, uh, music education, not, not, not musicology education, but music education, uh, I think it should start with clergy. I think, you know, Luther was great on this. Luther felt that if a pastor uh, didn't understand music, he, he shouldn't be a pastor. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it, I think that it's actually, um, I think that seminaries should make sure that there's a strong uh, component. And um, your seminary may do this for, for MDiv students as well as for music ministers. Uh, so I think there, there are, uh, again, practically, there are things that, uh, uh, that th there are resources in understanding how m musical, how assumptions about music uh, have, have, have shifted. Uh, again, I, I, uh, I'm sorry to promote my own work, but I've done interviews with quite a few uh, writers uh, over the years on music at, at Mars Hill Audio. Um, but I think that the biggest challenge congregationally is probably persuading people that, that, um, that their assumptions about music, that they've already embraced assumptions about music, that they've absorbed, and what they believe about music isn't just common sense or just what, what everybody has always believed. So again, that's why I think music education, with some music history education, will be important uh, in local churches. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, you, 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 you answered several questions that are coming in. People are asking about, okay, how should this influence music education? How can we help our pastors? And, and your comments there about pastors getting yeah. training in worship and music is, is, uh, is really, really helpful um, in, uh, in that regard as well. Uh, it, beyond, in terms of, of teaching the congregation, you know, music education centrally, uh, are, are there any... Uh, places in scripture or even church history that you would suggest starting to help the congregation understand the significance of music in their own lives uh, uh, and, and kind of help to yeah. disciple them in that way? Well, again, I, I would, um, I'm going to refer to some of those biblical passages in the second talk when I talk about beauty. Um, I, I, again, I would recommend uh, Calvin Stapert's work and Jeremy Begbie's uh, resounding truth uh, 
uh, let me add one one other thing here, and this this may uh, this may be a ch challenging to, to people. Um, one of the one of the other effects of of the Enlightenment, I, I mentioned that it was separation of reason from faith. Um, that the Enlightenment also uh, has had the effect of drawing a deep wedge between theology and philosophy. Uh, and uh, it's very difficult for contemporary Christians to, to think in terms that, that interweave uh, philosophical and theological practices and, and, and perspectives. And uh, th that was already happening before the Enlightenment, but it really becomes entrenched after the Enlightenment. And I, I mentioned that because of the fact that, um, that the best writers, in my view, the best writers on music aren't doing uh, just expository reflections, deducing from biblical statements. They are taking biblical concerns and combining them with, with philosophical ideas uh, and interweaving the two. And that's something that a lot of Christians are uncomfortable with, but I would suggest that... Um, that that uh, fracturing of 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 uh, of those two approaches, the purely exegetical deductive approach, and the more uh, speculative uh, approach, I think that that suspicion is also one of the effects of of, of the Enlightenment. So uh, I, I say that because a lot of the people who write best about music, they're not just doing uh, exegetical deductions; they're taking things that seem to be assumed. And I think this is the case in most theology. Uh, if you look at how the church developed its Christology, um, the church brought philosophical reflection to bear on what was in scripture uh, and basically said, what would have to be the case philosophically <laughs> for these biblical claims to be, to be true? 